We're glad to see you all here. Why aren't you somewhere else? Have you ever considered the right man in the wrong place? Well, that's an interesting thought. Right man in the wrong place. Could be the wrong man in the wrong place. Wrong man in the right place. That would probably cover more of this assembly, maybe the wrong man in the right place. But I'd say anybody that's here in the right place and like to think the motives were such that makes you having wanted to be here. God has fixed the boundaries and limitations of His whole creation. The creature is blessed when there is this realization and the Lord ordained, to take a little simple example, that fish should live in water. That's why that we say that's the fish's domain. Now, if you personified a fish, I suppose he could be like humans and say, well, they're just as big a fish out of water is in it. Fish may be right. But the whole truth is just this. That a fish very long out of water is a dead fish. Well, in the same way when you know your scriptures regarding the church and how God saves man through the gospel in the Lord's church then God has placed all spiritual life and all spiritual blessings in, in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. In 1 John 5 and verse 11, And this is the record, that God hath given us eternal life. And it says then, this life is in the Son. So it's rather... Foolhardy, wouldn't you think, to seek that eternal life elsewhere? It has often been difficult for people who love the Lord to abide in the right place, to be able to continually enjoy His blessings. So I think for a while that it would be a worthy study to review the lives of some very great men, of which we shall all be familiar. But these great men turned up in wrong places. And we will note that the right man in the wrong place cannot please God. First of all, if you go with me to the book of Genesis, the book of origins, the book of beginnings, in the third chapter, You'll find Adam, the first man, hiding from God. Well, you see, he had disobeyed God. He had sinned against God when he had eaten certain fruit that God had forbade Adam and Eve to eat. And that did something to him. And any time you do sin, it does something to you. And you find then the Lord... Asking, Adam, where art thou? And you remember the reply, Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. But you remember before he partook of the fruit and thereby sinned because God had forbidden them to partake of it. He had no concept of nakedness. A lot of things changed with man when he violated God's will. But Adam was in the wrong place at this time trying to hide from God. And for that matter, so is any man who tries to hide himself in sin. And that's the situation. That's why he was in the situation he was in. You remember that it was the wise man who said, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, Proverbs 15, 3. 
And you don't have just to read all of that in the Old Testament. When you come over to the New Testament of the Christ, we find uh, just as forceful comments and declaring that God sees all. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of, whom, of, whom, of Him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4 and verse 13. Well, in Adam's mind, he was hiding from God, but in reality, you can't do that. Uh, God knew all about him, knew everything, because God's all-knowing. He's omniscient. Whatever is the object of knowledge, it's a part of God, just like God is love. It all goes along with being God. But there are multiplied millions upon millions of people who are regularly in all sorts of sin, and they're trying to hide from God. The wicked lives that they're living, they're trying to hide from God. A very simple thing. It's very obvious to the person that says, I know God does not exist, I know it, and I can prove it. So when you have all this evidence coming up, that you can't explain certain things except that there was a mind behind it, and a mind of such caliber that could create all of this that evidence is designed, then one reason those people do not want to accept the obvious implication is because they would have to admit there'd be a God. And they're not about to do that. Hidden things are going to be revealed someday, and there's not a secret we'll have that won't be revealed. Romans 2.16, Paul wrote, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So Paul is declaring, as he wrote else, elsewhere, that God will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Again, as we said last week in a sermon, people think, well, I'll just have to give account of my actions. But here's another scripture. As we noticed last week, there was one that said that God knows your heart. God knows your thoughts. And we've sung another song today that talks about our desire as Christians to have a pure heart. So we are in effect as, un, in effect as unwise as Adam if we're trying to hide from God in sin. He not only sees, but He knows. He knows all about us. Counsels, plans, purposes, why everything he knows about us. But that's Adam. There was another man. Peter calls him a righteous man. A lot of times we don't think of him as that due to the poor choice he made. But that's Abraham's nephew, Lot. He was in a, a certain place. And why was he there? Well, as best we can tell from the divine record, it was because he was after material gain. Because you remember when they had trouble between the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot because they're, they had grown so rich, there was enough land for them. Abraham said, now, we don't want to have this strife. We be brethren. So he said, Lot, you pick whichever way you want to go and I'll choose the other one. Well, Lot saw, and being a good herdsman, many flocks, he said, uh, he saw the, the well-watered plains of the Jordan. And so the scripture says that he pitched his tent Toward Sodom. Well, again, right man in the wrong place. And just study Genesis 13 to understand more about that. The lure of material gain caused Lot to make that decision. And you must realize that it's not necessarily wrong that he made the decision. You know, this brings up something we sometimes do not understand. That a thing can be authorized by, in our case, the New Testament. But it may not be the best choice. In other words, God gives us a chance to prove our wisdom. There was nothing wrong within itself that Lot chose the well-watered plain of Jordan. Abraham said, that's the way we'll work it. And it was all right. And they had a right to decide that. God did not condemn that. But he should have thought further than the end of his nose. 
So this desire to have what was really best for the flocks and herds just didn't work too well. It put him awful close to one of the worst places he could have ever been on earth. I want to say this to our young people. It serves all of us well. Just because a thing is right to do doesn't mean it's the best thing to do. I think that gets overlooked very highly, and I think that's one thing parents do not instill in their children. They go so far as saying, well, yeah, that's a good thing. Just go to it. There's no sin in that. But they better think about Lot and why that's in your Bible and what you're to learn from it. When the New Testament says whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. He just simply didn't think about the spiritual influence and what was going to happen when he got mixed up in all that. Because in Sodom were all these evil, corrupted companions and a whole society of them. And they were all going to live lives that would make it very hard for a man to be godly. It didn't say he couldn't be. That's the reason Peter, by inspiration, calls the man living amongst all that mess a righteous man. But I wonder if he thought about his daughters. There's no indication that he said, yes, that is a well-watered plain and I've got all these flocks and herds and they've got to have a place. Abraham has given me this choice and I'll choose that. But did he think about his family? Did he think maybe they won't be able to withstand what I'm able to withstand? There's something to that when it comes to the husband and the father being the head of the house. And guiding the house to make the right choices. It takes more than just saying, well, that's authorized by the Bible. We can do it. There's no sin in it. You would have to say that about what Lot did. But there wasn't a lot of wisdom in it. In fact, as you know, even his wife ended up being lost in the overthrow. But there are myriads of people who are daily in one way or the other, one extent or the other, pitching their tents towards Sodom, all in a mad quest to have a better material life. We live in an evil and corrupt society. There's no two ways about it. What do we do about it? God put us here to be the leavening for good by the way we live and what we teach. We must be able to build ourselves up, yet we have the guiding words of be not deceived. Don't be led astray. Don't follow a falsehood. Evil, companions, corrupt, good, morals. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Maybe that this job pays a lot more and there's not a thing more wrong with the job itself. What, are there other extenuating situations and circumstances that might ought to be considered? So by turning to the wrong environs, we can seal our doom for eternity. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many hurtful or foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Then Paul said it, for the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, in the Greek it says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Which while some coveted after. Now notice the key word is coveted. The key word is coveted. In other words, you want that so much you're willing to give up anything or take on anything to get it. And that's all that's on your mind. The more you get, the happier you are. But you can't be happy with what you got, so you want more. Thinking you'll be happy when you get more, but that only makes you want more. The old statement is made, or the story is told, of a fellow who was very rich. Somebody asked him, uh, just how much more do you want? He said, just a little bit more. That pretty well defines covetousness. There's never an end to it. They've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. First Timothy 6, 9 through 10. doesn't mean these folks actually gained the wealth. But they tried 
And that took up all their time. So how often are the souls of children sacrificed to a God of gold and all the time declaring, we don't offer children to idols anymore. So when you're tempted to turn to materialism, think of the record that God gave you of Lot. But we leave Abraham and or Adam and we leave Lot. And we come to a fellow by the name of Jonah. And you'll remember that he thought he could run away from God because he didn't want to do what God told him. He was commissioned of God to preach that very wicked city of Nineveh. Jonah 1, 1, 1 through 3. But now he just didn't want to do that. If you really look throughout the book of Jonah, you'll see exactly what the problem was. He had the same attitude of a whole lot of Jews in the days of Jesus. That is, toward anybody that was not a Jew. They were worthless. Don't have anything to do with them. They're the offscouring of the earth. If you read the book, you'll see why he did not want to go preach the word of God to them. His reasoning was this. If I preach the word of God to them and they repent, guess what God's going to do? He's going to forgive them. Ain't that terrible? Now the Jews had this in their hands for a long time before Jesus came to this earth and they'd never learned a lesson. They had never learned the lesson of Jonah. And so many times in the church, about all we get out of it is Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. And that's not even the message. So he thought it better to flee from an unpleasant task. And he, I guess you could say, he bought a one-way ticket to Tarshish. Paid the fare, and he made the trip. But he was in the wrong place. Because he wasn't where God wanted him to be. Where God told him to be. He wasn't doing what God wanted him to do. Well, you remember there was a very terrible storm, and Jonah took the world's first submarine ride uh, in this big fish. Now, Jonah really was doing what a lot of folks do, but maybe not for the same reason. He didn't want to preach it just like he was told because of what I said a while ago. If I preach this and they understand this and they believe this and they really repent, then God's going to forgive them. Which also should have shown the Jew all that many years before, God loves Gentile too. He loves the Gentiles as much as he loves you. But he didn't. And they didn't in Jesus' day. He may have been afraid of persecution or who knows what it was, but be that as it may, that was the situation. But you know, there, there are actually husbands today who are afraid to preach it straight to their wives. Oh, I'm meddling now, buddy. And there are wives who fear of violating the headship of their husband who won't even tell the husband that he's wrong. Now, if that's your view, wife, that you're violating headship of your husband, if you pointed out a sin in his life, you misconstrued the whole headship of the husband and you misconstrued your responsibility. I don't know of anything in the Bible that says that a person cannot point out to another person, husband, wife, son or daughter, uncle or aunt, mom or daddy, where they've transgressed God's law. Seems to me a loving wife who really understands her duty as a wife is God's given it to her. And uh, one who loves the husband and knows what his role is, seems to me she's a logical one if the husband is the one that's sinning to tell him so. And vice versa. Parents, boy, nowadays this really gets strong. Parents are afraid to preach it straight to their kids. Or else they'll preach it, but they won't put any teeth in it. <laughs> Look all around us. I read... Uh, I read a speech made back about 1968 by a college president. And he was talking about what things are going to be like if we don't get kids back under proper authority. And I was reading it and I thought, yep, I can see it firsthand of where I look. And he had it pretty well nailed, even though he was writing it nearly 50 years ago, as to what's going to happen to this country if we don't get those things back like they ought to be. Of course, when you come to many teenage kids, they aren't afraid of anything. 
They aren't afraid of anybody or anything, and they will tell you this is where it's going to be, and it's going to be, or there's going to be all sorts of messes going on. All because things weren't worked like God wants it, and too many people, maybe the right people, in the wrong place. There are a lot of folks today in the church who are fleeing unpleasant tasks. There are folks that know their Bible. There are folks that live it. But they're not going to be deacons and elders, and they're not going to be preachers because it's unpleasant. If you do all God said you ought to do as an elder and as a deacon and as a preacher and possibly a Bible class teacher, then you're going to have to do some extra time. And you're not going to do it. You're going to have to have folks get upset with you no matter how godly you live. And so they simply want to run from responsibility and problems. So it's not nice. It's not fun to engage in unpleasant tasks rather than having the willpower and the courage of one's convictions to do what's right. Well, that's what the world needs, folks. I think we'd readily agree with that. But um, who wants to volunteer? The world is in far greater jeopardy than Nineveh is. There's a lot of folks trying to get to the ticket window to buy a one-way ticket to Tarsus, too. I wish we'd learn just from Jonah's lesson before we have to have some big fish to swallow us. And you know, he may not throw us up. We may go through the whole digestive tract and wind it all up that way. But then there was the young prophet in the wrong place, believing a lie. You can read of this young prophet of God in 1 Kings chapter 13. Again, he was in the wrong place. Place because of having believed a lie. Think of how many people are out there like that today. Whether it's uh, social matters or whether it's spiritual matters, whatever it is, marriage in the home, they're in the wrong place because they're believing a lie. Think of how many people are living without the benefit of marriage, but living as man and wife, but they're not. Just think what a mess that's doing in this country. This young prophet had been faithful to the first part of what God called him to do. But there was no lying prophet there. I've often wondered about that lying prophet. I really have. I've tried to figure him out. If he had been at one time a faithful prophet of God, then he knew what was going to happen to the young prophet when he lied to him and yet told him he was a prophet of God and what he was saying was from God. But it didn't seem to bother him. And yet after the young prophet is dead, you know, he's so sorry. He goes and buries him and all that stuff. There's things there I don't grasp. Well, today there are Christians deceived into thinking they can hobnob with all kinds of worldliness. Just a little bit of it won't hurt. And God's going to say, that's all right. You're one of my children. And um, I'll allow a little bit. After all, I'm a gracious God. And I'm a loving God. Well, they've been lied to by false prophets that teach a cheap, that, uh, teach a cheap grace. And they simply compromise with the devil. They're found in the wrong place, the worldly dance hall, beer joint, casinos, everything like that. Of course, you see advertised Las Vegas, Nevada. And they actually call it Sin City. The people who know what sin is and live in sin and enjoy sin, it's Sin City. But people still go there and enjoy it. There are religious people who hold membership in churches that you couldn't read about in the Bible. And you try to tell them about it, show them, and just give them the New Testament. Say, please show me the church of which you are a member in the Bible. Well, of course, they've been fed a bunch of malarkey. It says, I don't have to find it in the Bible. And they think that, well, I'm sincere in it, and if I'm sincere in it and want to offer it to God for His cake, then He'll accept it. It just won't work that way. How sad to hear the sentence and the judgment that we already know is going to take place. Depart from me, I never knew you, ye that work iniquity, and the everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. 
And, and you can see somebody like the young prophet. But he lied unto him. 1 Kings 13, 18. I have the responsibility not to be deceived. I don't know how many times in the New Testament it says, be not deceived. That tells me I have a responsibility not to be deceived. Well, to be deceived means I believe the lie. So I have to know the difference in the lie and the truth. If I know the truth, I know anything contrary to the truth is a lie. And I don't believe it. And we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, are we? But then there's Elijah. Good man. We feel a lot of Elijahs today. But we find him also in the wrong place at one time. He was hiding from the duty, the obligations God laid upon him, which tells us the greatest of men in service to God can become depressed and dejected and down and out and just say, well, if they want to go to hell and they're running over me to go to hell, then why not let them? I'll just get out of the way and go mind my business. Let them just storm right down there. Well, few, I think, stand as greater in faith than Elijah, the great prophet. But when old wicked Ahab and his marvelous Miss America wife Jezebel rose up to slay him, remember what Elijah did? He went off in the cave and hid. Sometimes we think we'd do great wonders. Well, you can't be a greater prophet than Elijah. But when, when it got hard, he went to a cave and hid. When the Lord asked him, here's what he asked him. What doest thou here? Have you ever wondered if the Lord in his mind right now is looking at you and saying, What are you doing here? The idea is, and all you know and all you've been and all you understand about life and what you are in the church and your, your personal duty to God, what are you doing here? That's why I, why I started the sermon off. Buddy, why? What are you doing here? We have to have something that makes us think, and if it can be funny and make us think, that's fine. I like it a lot better when it can be funny it makes us think than when it makes you mad and makes you think. <laughs> it works out better for the fellow that did it. Elijah had to admit that he feared for his life. I don't know what it's quite like to have people hunting me down because I'm preaching the gospel to them and they're going to kill me if they get me. And by order of the government, they're going to do it. But he did. Just read 1 Kings chapter 19. After having been such a man of faith, then here's a great man of faith showing lack of faith in God's providential care. The Lord had to assure him that he had 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. And still there with us those who lack that kind of faith. They can't stand by themselves in the midst of adversity to do what they genuinely know God wants them to do. They only move with crowds. No wonder Moses said, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Somebody said, Well, isn't it just as bad to follow one person to do evil? Well, of course it is. Well, why would he say, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil? Because when everybody else is doing it, it's a lot easier you do it with them. It also means if you don't do it with them, they may not take a liking to you too well. There are many today, and they're hiding for fear of persecution, tribulations. Somebody's going to say something bad about them. And there's others do this. Well, I know I can't be perfect, and I'm going to make a mistake. So I just, I just would rather not try. You know, let Jeff do it. If we keep, you know, at some point down the line, if we want to let Jeff do it, either one of you, whichever one spells your name's right and the other one doesn't. <laughs> you have to figure that out. Whichever one that is, someday Jeff won't be here to do it. Now who's going to do it? Now who's going to do it? Somebody had to say, well, I can try. I can do it. What about, have you ever thought about this when it comes to song leading? Well, I can't sing. We need song leader. Well, I can't sing. Well, we need somebody to do this or we need somebody to do that. Well, I can't do it. Wouldn't it be nice if people just say, I know what entails in that and I'm not going to do it. Let Jeff do it. <laughs> Many have sinned, or signed, I shouldn't say, well, they sinned maybe too. But they signed a non-aggression pact, if you please. And they signed it with the devil. 
because they had to stand alone. Well, I admit, I, I don't like to be the only one standing for the truth. I think of John the Baptizer, forerunner of the Christ, and he stood up there to Herod and his living companion, who civil law-wise he had married, or it was his brother Philip's wife, and said, it is not lawful for thee to have her. Yeah, but he got his head chopped off. All because he made that comment. Better be our heads where John was and enjoying glory with God forever than for our heads to remain on our shoulders when we should have spoken up and lost it, that heaven would be our home. God's with us. He's promised to be with us. He can get us through things that we cannot understand how. And if you try to figure out how God's going to do a lot of things, you're just wasting time. Just do what's right. And what did he say? I'll be with you. When we're willing to trust God on the basis of what he teaches in the Bible, and to the best of our ability, follow him wherever he leads, we'll find that even today there are 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal, and we might not find them out if we don't take the stand ourselves by ourselves. Last one, we go to the New Testament. The great Apostle Peter. Certainly a wrong, in a wrong place. When he warmed himself by the fire, the night the Lord was betrayed by Judas Iscariot and arrested. You read that in Luke 22, 40, uh, 54 through 62. Remember that Peter had followed the far off I'm amazed that if I'd been there, if I'd even been that close, however far off was, I think I'd have been further. A lot of times I say, oh no, I wouldn't have done that. Have you ever been where Peter was? Sometimes we boast great things, but when it comes right down to where we are and dealing with what we got to deal with, it doesn't take having to be in those circumstances before sometimes we're following them far off. He was in the midst of the very enemies of the Lord. Therefore, it became easier for him to deny Christ. How carefully Christians should shun all places and all kinds of associates which make it easy for them to deny the Lord in all the ways you can do it. You just can't warm by the devil's fireside. You can't do that and fraternize with evil men without weakening your faith and even willing to swear to say you don't know Jesus. When it wasn't long before that, he was saying, though they all forsake thee, I won't. I don't know, because I haven't been put to those kind of tests, exactly what I would do in some tests. I know what I ought to do. I know what the Bible says I should do. But I haven't quite been put to the test yet. So with that in mind, we ought to be cautious and careful and not boast great things, as Peter did. And then it all blew up in his face. Where heaven and hell are discounted and the lust of the flesh are gratified, there Christians must not be found. I say this to our young people. The Bible still says, as I said earlier, be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Don't tell yourself the lie and believe it that you can buddy up with the wicked people and you'll just be the finest Christian you ever were before you buddied up with them. It won't work. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, Paul said to the church in Thessalonica, abstain from the very appearance of evil. Now, a lot of times people say, well, um, that means that when... It looks like evil even. I should get away from it. That's not what it says. When evil appears, run. That's what it means. It doesn't mean, well, it looks like evil, so I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Well, that might be a pretty good guideline too. That's not what this verse is. This verse is saying when you see evil pop its head up, you run from it. Now, you want to see it practiced? Well, just remember Joseph. One well-programmed the Word of God, 
courage of his convictions. Boy, what a mess he put himself into, all because he wouldn't commit fornication with that woman. How can I do this great sin before God? Wouldn't that be wonderful if all of us would think that? How can I violate God's will? Think of what all God's done for you. Think about what Jesus did for you. Think about where you are today and all the people who love you and who are praying for you to be godly. What a, what a situation we're in sometimes. But that's the attitude we ought to have. Now as we close the lesson, each of these examples, and there are others that we've seen in the Scriptures, should be admonishing us, old or young, whatever, should be helping us to learn we should keep in mind that any follower of God may lack in caution and soon be found in the wrong place. I think the best thing anybody can do as a normal human being is say, whatever sins out there that a person can commit, I can do it. So I'm going to keep myself from it since I know I can. And the devil wants me to. And the devil's a roaring lion going about seeking who may devour. You have to have the resolve I'm not going to do it. Every man in here that is normal, still functioning, could commit fornication tonight. Every man in here could commit adultery. Same with the women. Why don't you do it? Well, you sure won't get the society to condemn you. Why don't you do it? Oh, I can do it this way. See, nobody's ever going to know, and you can confess it sin, and repent of it. So what's wrong? And that's the way it works, folks, if you've even got that much knowledge of the Bible to cause you to have even those thoughts. When you know something is wrong, run from it. So each of us should firmly resolve to get into Christ, stay in Christ, faithful to Him, and stay out of everything else. That will be the right man or woman in the right place. Then and only then can we be assured of our God's marvelous guidance and blessing in serving Him till heaven's our home. So any sin out there, you just ask yourself, why don't I go do it? After all, people commit sin. There's pleasure in sin. Nobody ever denied that. It's only for a little while. Because you won't. You have made a conscious decision, I will not do it. How can I do this great sin before God? It's that resolve that will help you overcome sin. It's when you say, I can do it, I'm not going to do it. Or it needs to be done, well, I've never done it, but I can sure try. That's the only way you're going to amount to anything in the Lord's kingdom. If you're not a Christian this afternoon, we beg of you to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of sins. The Lord will add you to His church. And therein, you're the right person in the right place. Now be faithful. And if you sin, truly from the heart, turn from those sins in full repentance, confessing them and praying God for forgiveness. We ask you now then to respond to the good gospel invitation thinking about these things and applying it to your life in all honesty while together we stand and sing.